Hello. Welcome, welcome. Hello, everybody tuning in on Facebook and other means. This is Amy. I'm the VP of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. And I'm really glad you're here again. Saying it again, what a joy it is to share this world with wildlife. And it is a challenge. Today we're gonna to talk about it. We are gonna explore the beautiful country of Uganda, home to beautiful forests, uh, magnificent wildlife, including primates like chimpanzees and incredible people. However, everyone needs to share resources and that is not always easy. Rarely does a conservation organization come along that just embraces humanity and the good in people and the ability to empower people like the one we're gonna talk about today. We are going to be with Michael Stern and Rebecca Goldstone, founders of New Nature Foundation. This is Cocktails and Conservation. You're watching Cocktails and Conservation, where we rendezvous with inspiring wildlife, wildlife conservation life. leaders from around the planet. Hear their stories, learn how they protect the animals we love, and how each of us can help them. With our featured custom cocktail, together we toast to taking action for wildlife. All right, here we are. This is Cocktails and Conservation, where we meet wildlife heroes from around the world. We hang out together, we get to hear their stories, join their solutions, and having a refreshing, have a refreshing beverage with people like you who like to have fun and want to take action, want to know how they can help. I am your host. My name is Amy Gottliff. I'm the Vice President of Conservation at Oakland Zoo. As conservation is centered to our mission, we needed a new way to gather together, um, learn and do good. This is our way to gather safely, um, raise awareness and support for the great partners that we have around the world. Um, also support local restaurants and bars with our cocktail, um, build community, get to hang out with people like you, um, and have fun. So we do like to pretend every time we're together, thematically pretend. So this time we're going to pretend we are in Uganda. Um, we're going to pretend we are in the jungles of Kabali, which are completely gorgeous. Um, we're under fig trees. We're listening to colobus monkeys. Maybe we're seeing them jump around over us. Um, we're hearing chimpanzees. And we met some really cool people around the fire. Maybe I shouldn't say fire in Oakland right now. We just met some people, yeah, um, in the dining hall overlooking the beautiful forest. And we're having a drink and we're having a great time. So if you're down to hang out with us like that, why don't you show your chimpanzee love by just typing pant hoot there in the comments. All right, also, if you wanna get started early and mix up your cheeky monkey from the Golden Bull in Oakland, um, the recipe will be right there in the chat, and later on we're gonna be learning exactly how to do it, but maybe you are ready to go. All right, um, while you're doing that, I want to pose a question, um, and I'm sure this is the question that Michael and Rebecca posed to themselves so many years ago, um, and that's why are people so important when it comes to saving wildlife? Why can't you just block the animals? <laughs> Why are people just such an important ingredient? Ponder that, go ahead and put it out there. Um, thank you for joining us, everybody. Why are they so important in your mind? Um, that's what we're gonna explore. All right, so yay, it's so good to see people. Welcome, welcome. Anyone who just happened to be on Facebook, um, Oakland Zoo staff and docents and volunteers, um, Friends of the Wild, any donor that we have, thank you. Um, New Nature Foundation friends and family, and chimpanzee people, um, AZA people, and anybody who loves going to the Golden Bull in Oakland. Great place. All right, 
Yay, it's good to see everyone. We are talking today to the founders of the New Nature Foundation, Rebecca Goldstone and Michael Stern. And I will just say how honored I am to have known them for so many years um, and see them start from just such an amazing place in their completely creative solutions to protecting forests and animals and watch them evolve their methods and their stories and their practices. Um, as life evolves and time evolves, they're always creative. Their methods are super innovative and I have tapped them so many times to share this idea or that idea with all the other organizations that we work with because they are on it. And I'm so excited to welcome them right about now. Here we go. Three, two, one. Three, two. Hi, everybody. Hi, Amy. Oh, all right. So it's kind of exciting. You're not here with us in California. You're way over there. Not in Uganda, but in Philadelphia. The whole other side of the country. The whole other side of the country where it's nighttime and probably not smoky. Not smoky. Not right now. No, thank goodness. All right, lucky you. Um, how has your lives been during COVID? We've been home a lot more. Obviously, Rebecca is normally traveling around the world to Uganda and Vietnam and helping out with all the different projects and running things over there, but we've been doing a lot from home now. Um, I work at the Philadelphia Zoo. I'm the curator for primates and small mammals, so I'm still going in to work every day. Um, but, you know, life goes on and we're, we're all making do just the way everybody is. All right. And um, you do go to Uganda often. Do you miss it, Rebecca? Oh. I do. I do miss it very, very much. It's been, it's only been since February. I was there then. Um, but anyone who's gone there, anyone who's come to visit us knows uh, it just kind of gets into your blood and you just keep wanting to keep coming back. And Facebook Messenger and WhatsApp just doesn't do the trick. It just doesn't really fill your heart with the kind of um, fulfillment that you get from being in, in that beautiful country and in that beautiful forest. So I miss it and I can't wait to go back and I hope I can go back soon, soon, soon. Um, I can understand that, it is incredible. I feel so lucky to have gotten to visit you guys there. One thing that I love, while I call you Rebecca and Michael, or we all do here, is that in that area of Uganda that you guys work in, everyone has a nickname. Will you explain that and tell us what your nicknames are? It's true, yeah. Everybody in uh, in in the Toro region has an Mpako or a, or a pet name, and there's only so many of them. So automatically, whenever you meet somebody with the same pet name as yourself, you've got a very close bond, and you share something with them. And you know, you might meet someone with the same pet name as your mom, and so you feel a different bond with them than you would otherwise. But our very first trip to Uganda in the year 2000, we um, got to the forest and got to the house that we were going to be living in for the next three months and it was empty. Everybody was out in the field doing their primate research and we just sat on the stoop and didn't know what to do and out of the forest comes Margaret Kemagisa who after many, many years of being friends and working together, she is the manager of the project in Uganda now and many other things. I'm sure we'll talk about her later. But she was the one who gave us our empacos. And I am a moti, and this is a boki. I am a boki. Now, a boki means pig, which some people would think is bad, but I love it. And a moti means lion, so people really enjoy that. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, you don't call your mom mom, you call her your pet name. You don't call your, your boss boss, you call her her pet name. So it's a really endearing part of the culture that... Um, it just, uh, it's like nowhere else in the world. And I, I know that Amy happens to be a Kiki, which is the cat. Um, so it is a special honor to have an Mpako and um, we're proud to be who we are. It's so cool. All right, so while people are jumping on, um, I want to thank everyone who has been going to these, coming to these, donating, and also people who've been supporting the zoo. Um, it's been wonderful. I really, we all appreciate the love the zoo's gotten. And I wanna refocus energy right now, all of our love and generosity and time just on this project, New Nature Foundation, which really is part of the zoo. These partnerships are what 
what makes us do the real, real deep work in the world. We do it through these wonderful people. So um, focus any kind of love and generosity you're feeling right now or in the next hour or moving forward just on the fantastic work these guys are doing. All right. So I want to start with just the, um, the word coexistence which is something that we need to do all over the world. And I see so many different ways people choose to do it. Um, everything feels really difficult um, and challenging to kind of find you know, the magic ingredient that's gonna really work for those animals, that habitat, those people. And I have to say, like, I've never seen anything like what you guys do out there. It's, it's the most exciting, kind of engagement with the public that that I've seen anywhere on the planet in any of the presentations I've gone to. And I just want to share with everybody um, just how how wonderful and deep the work is that you do there. And I want to start by saying like, how did you even begin? And then I'm going to share this photo to show how long you've been working out there. You look like babies. Oh, we still look like babies now. You do. Yeah, so this is Michael and I in 2000 uh, on our first trip to Uganda. Um, and I just want to touch on what you said about how everything is so difficult right now. And we all have to find a way to coexist and work. You know, it's been very challenging for me from this standpoint to, to put our project out there when there's so many other issues and so many other disasters happening all over the world. Um, but we're all part of it and we're all connected and we all need to coexist. So I needed to actually tell myself to speak up and to get my voice out there, remind people, because the work that we're doing, each one of us feels the impact of it. Any of you who've been here, who've been to Uganda know it. And we all are connected and it's really important. So that is the lead into how we created this family in Uganda. Michael and I have been dating since 1995. We're high school sweethearts. And so we started this project as a family and we created a family out of it. And we did it for, with love and joy and with the idea that it was always gonna be something that we were always gonna be connected with. Just like we're connected, we're connected to the people, Margaret, the first person we ever met in Uganda in 2000 and everybody that we work with. So, and we're connected to all of you. I mean, Oakland Zoo has been supporting us forever. Since the very, very beginning of this project. Yeah, Oakland Zoo has been real driving force and behind all of this. When I think about, I don't wanna say the same things to some of you who know what we do already, it's still just as important as it was 20 years ago and the problems still exist and that's why we're still there. The fact is that we are still there and a lot of people don't stick around. So I think that's kind of one of the things that I wanted to make sure that we got across. But so yeah, so we started young, we started uh, when we were 20, we did research and we met the people and we saw the communities around the park struggling while you know other you know people were documenting the extinction of a species of a tree species of a monkey of a deforestation of a forest and we said what can we do to give back to the people who are right around here they're the ones who need, are immediately impacted by this and they're the ones that can make more of an you know a broader they can send a broader message to a bigger community so that's how we got started and created what we did um, and fell in love with Uganda and fell in love with the people. And it's that's how it's all been created. And I should also say Michael's been in love with chimps since he's been a baby. And that's kind of also been a big reason for all this to get started. Um, yeah, I love that story. I mean, you went to study and try to understand animals and you really realized this bigger story is about the community. But let's talk about those chimpanzees. This okay. is a I'm proud of because I took it in Kabali and there they are trying to live their lives in the forest and it's not easy for them. So I want to touch base a little bit about um, some of the issues. I I mean, amazing creatures, right? If, if you've met them, if you've seen them at Oakland Zoo, if you've seen them even on television, you can get a sense of how amazing these creatures are. Are really our cousins, 98.6% identical DNA to a human. Uh, which means they are our closest living relatives. But the part that blows my mind is that not only are they our closest relatives, we are their closest relatives. Okay, that's to say that uh, they are more similar to us than they are to a gorilla, genetically speaking. So we really are these two cousin species 
uh, moving through the millennia together. And it worked out well through most of most of history, right? Um, but then you come to the modern age and population growth has really caused a lot of issues. So in different parts of the world, that means different things. In Kibali, where we still have 1,400 chimpanzees living in this relatively small national park, so it's a nice, healthy population of chimps, uh, but they're really, really threatened by small-scale firewood collection. So we're lucky in that we don't have... Um, large industry cutting down the forest like you might have with soy or palm oil in other parts of the world. We're really lucky that we don't have commercial poaching the way that uh, you have in some other parts of the world. So there's nobody uh, actively targeting the chimps and the monkeys as meat. But what you have is a growing human population just trying to get by every day. And what you see in this photo here are some hills that used to be forested not that long ago. Um, there was at least little patches of forest left on them, and now, as you can see, they are completely deforested, farm against farm against farm. And um, you know, Uganda has one of the fastest growing populations in the world. So, whereas people used firewood to cook with all through history, at some point, about 20 years ago, it hit a tipping point and it became unsustainable. And so, people who are just trying to cook their dinner, they're not getting rich off of cutting down the forest. They're not part of some international criminal syndicate. They're just trying to cook their dinner. And uh, it's, it's causing a problem for the chimpanzees and all the other animals in there. So this is Agnes in this photo who's carrying about a day's worth of firewood on her head. And if you multiply that by the tens of thousands of people living around the park, you can imagine how that really makes a difference. Yep, and they gotta eat. <laughs> they gotta cook their food. Yeah. Um, I think this is a compelling shot that tells a story too. Yeah, I mean, this is just to remind folks that um, people around Kibali are living in poverty and they are full of joy and they are happy people and generally well fed, very, very uh, fertile soil there. So even on an acre or so of land, which is the average farm size, you can grow enough food to feed a family of eight or a family of 10. Um, but what we're looking at with our partners there are people who are really just trying to get by day to day. And so when we're looking at solutions um, for people to be able to get what they need while the forest also gets what it needs, they really have to be within reach of absolutely everybody. They have to be solutions that don't cost any money, that you can do for yourself, that you can do with the materials that you have on hand in the village. And uh, these kids, if you look just to the side of the photo, there is a new nature stove uh, just in the corner there. And so they're one of the families who is doing this. They're helping themselves while also helping the, the forest. Wow. Well, um, I, I love the photos just of people. And I feel like you hit on some secret ingredient that has to do with this when you decided to come up with solutions. And can you elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, I think that, um, you know, I, 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 I do think part of it is that we started so early and we were so naive and we and there were there wasn't all these problems in the world that we deal with every day. But it's also the Batoro people and the people in Uganda that we dealt with that with with the daily struggle of not finding enough firewood to cook your food, of dealing with malaria, of not having shoes to walk the six miles to school, to not being able to go to school. Carrying every drop of water that you drink or farming every there bit is, of food that you eat. There is still a, a true sense of joy in the people that we work with and that we know. And that's what we, we were taught by Uganda, the way to approach this problem. Yes, you need to find solutions that are gonna help chimpanzees, but you have to do it in a way that's gonna relate to the culture that it exists with. And in this culture, it better make you smile or you're not gonna get anywhere. And people, just that's what that's what made our project so successful and continues to let it evolve is that people keep continuing to want to smile and laugh and they want me to just keep reminding them and give them new things to laugh and smile about and it can be and it can be something as serious as you know an endangered species that that is so important and just such an important part of our world but it can be done in a way that can also bring pleasure and happiness to people 
You guys are amazing. All right. So we're talking about the problem now and then yeah. we're going to have a little drink and move into the incredible solutions you have. But I'm going to give someone a chance if they feel like it to ask a question about the problem. Anyone have a question about the problem? Well, I will just say that Linda Valley wants to say this really brings back memories of her visit. And different people at Oakland Zoo did get to go visit. Um, they never forget it. And, and they, they see the poverty and they see the joy and everyone comes back with their mind pretty much blown. So I'll be watching for questions if you have them. I'll try to pop them in. Meanwhile, um, before we have drinks, we always ask a trivia question. So I am going to pop up an image and I'm going to let our teacher in the house here. Um, All right. So well, here's the story. We, uh, you know, we, we really do try to inspire people to uh, be creative and have all kinds of expressions of art. And we have a lot of wonderful artists, but we also get a lot of submissions of things that are really ridiculous. So I thought it'd be a lot of fun to play a game of guess what in the world this is. Ooh. So you get the image and then you're, we'll give, you know, you guys can all guess and we have one or two of these. Um, have some fun with that. I mean, we're not making fun of anybody. We're just seeing their interpretation of an animal they've never seen. And um, it's a lot of fun. So. Let us know what you think this first crazy, wonky animal is. And your only clue is that it's from Uganda. All right. So everybody who's on, what animal do you think this is? Take a really good look. I'll give you a minute. And then we're going to have a cocktail. It looks like a fuzzy bird sort of thing. Dotted fuzzy bird. All right. So here we go. Um, I want to now thank our drink creators. Um, this is the Golden Bull in Oakland. Like the cutest bar ever. They have amazing live music back in the day. Um, really just good vibe. They've done good things for Oakland Zoo before. They're so sweet. Um, right now they are um, open to sit outside. Um, you can, they say, luxuriate at one of their spaced out golden bowl sidewalk adventure tables. Um, get a beer, um, get a drink, and they're working with a pizzeria so you can get some pizza. And they also deliver. So we are ready to learn about <laughs> some good guesses, right? Oh, a Golubus monkey. We are going to hide all this, have our drink, and then find out what kind of creature that is. Here we go. Hello, my name is Nikki, and I am representing the Golden Bowl Bar in downtown Oakland. We are a wonderful music venue with all kinds of different music. It's a beautiful old historic building, and we make fresh cocktails. We have uh, craft beers from all over the Bay Area. And when I'm not doing that, I'm actually volunteering my time uh, in primates care and conservation. I've been volunteering with the Oakland Zoo on the primate string for about six years. And last year, I spent a month in Africa at Ape Action Africa, um, volunteering there at their sanctuary. And that's what gave me the inspiration of this drink. Um, what I remember from there is we had just all kinds of really wonderful fresh fruits. Um, and so, I am going to make you a cheeky monkey. So how we do that is um, I cut up some fresh mango and it's about a half of a cup of fresh mango. I'm using this clear pint glass so that you can see what I'm doing here. Um, and then we'll take that mango and we muddle it, which basically means smash it until you can get most of the juice out. <laughs> um, this mango isn't super juicy, so it's going to take a little while. And, okay, so there's that. And then I have uh, lime juice. This is about uh, half of a lime. It's worth of lime juice. And then I made some um, 
simple syrup using a raw cane sugar, which is easy. It's just um, basically half and half of sugar and boiling hot water and you pour the water in and stir it really vigorously until it turns into a liquid. So we do about a half an ounce of this. And um, take about four or five ice cubes. Can't forget the booze. Here's some gin. We do um, two ounces. There we go. All right, and then we shake this up about 30 seconds or so. It'll press the mango a little bit more also and make everything nice and cold. So then we're going to pour this into this coupe glass. It would also be really good over ice. I just think it looks nicer this way. And double strain it so that we get all of the mango bits out. I really like the color of this drink. All right, and then just top it off with a little club soda. And then if you'd like to do a little rosemary, it kind of represents the trees in the rainforest. And if you want to be really cheeky, you can get yourself some uh, cheeky cocktail charms and put in a little monkey. And there you have it, the cheeky monkey. Cheers everybody and stay safe. Mm. Mm. All right. Cheers. <laughs> Clean. All right, now we do our little review. Here we go. To Taking Action for Wildlife, to Rebecca and Michael, a big hug. Let's do this together. Now, plug a lug. Ooh. Mmm. Delicious. Delicious. Oh. Hey! A really good drink. Let me see if I can do it. Oh, no. Guys, it's so strong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is something that we wanted to bring to you and we forgot, so I wanted to present it to you now and we'll get it in the mail to you. We gladly accept, it's beautiful. Okay, we, we did it. All right, okay, now let's see if we can find out the answer. Are we ready, everybody? Here we go. Chimpanzee. Well, of course, it is a chimpanzee. Anybody get that? Yeah, somebody got it. Woo, Karen Faber, you got it. All right. The next one's a little tougher. We'll see that later, I think, yeah? Oh, we're gonna try one more. Are we ready for one more? Mm. All right, let's take a little look. And while we're looking at that and contemplating that creature, um, I hear you didn't put mango in your drink. That's Rebecca. Oh, thanks for Yes, it's true. Mine is a, a lemon, lemon uh, version. So while you're thinking about whatever random animal this is, the first time I ever tried mango was in Uganda in that first year where Michael had a beard and I had no hair. And I had one bite and I didn't like it. And then all night long, I was like itching and freaking out. And we, we didn't have electricity. And um, I don't know if we had a flashlight, but if we did, it didn't prove anything. And I was like, Michael, Michael, there's something wrong. He's like, go to sleep, there's nothing we can do. Like, there's just nothing, just stop, go to bed. Wake up in the morning, totally covered in hives, just head to toe, itchy, crazy, and nothing to do. Just still in the middle of the rainforest with nothing to do. So Michael says, well, I know that if we, if we, you know, get hot water on your, on your itches, it's going to release and you're going to feel better. So we start boiling hot water in individual little pots, letting it cool enough. And then he just starts throwing it on me. I'm screaming, Lord knows what the rest of the people in the camp were thinking. And in between I'm running around and jumping up and down and going crazy. 
And eventually Michael's like, we can't just continue to do this. Like we can't just keep just burning you. So he said, let's just go into the field and let's do our research and hopefully that'll get your mind off of it. <laughs> Which it didn't. No. no. So apparently I have a pen, pencil and like my, my notebook, but I'm running around in circles going crazy. And this woman, some angel, who I still don't know, so if you're watching, I yeah. love you, came out with a fanny pack and it had Benadryl inside of it. And she said, you need Benadryl. And it was, that was the moment. And then I remember the last bit is that I fell asleep taking notes on the monkeys jumping because I'd taken the Benadryl. So I think like Michael found me just like completely passed out. And then we got the nicknames along with our other ones of Itchy and Spotty, or it was Olympia and Spotty. Yeah, I had Michael, a broken foot at the time. Michael broke his foot. I was covered in hives. Yeah. And we were just an absolute Olympia mess. and Spotty never traveled to Uganda without Benadryl again. Yeah. That's the moral of the story. Got it. We will remember that. Well, you made it through. All right. Let's see. For the win, it is a... Hyena. Hyena. Oh, you guys did good that time. They were ready for that one. Very close. Very close. All right. All right. We've had our fun. Um, okay. So I love that you just do creative, educational, fun things with people. And those are at something that's just so key to your project. And we want to hear all about it. Okay. So these are our science centers. You're seeing children. Uh, this is the outside of one of them. They are natural history museums like that we all know and love. Um, again, it was that sense that uh, we certainly enjoyed them growing up. We knew that we could replicate them and, and give people an opportunity to experience this kind of stuff for themselves. Play with a puppet, draw a weird, weird hyena, um, hold an elephant bone. We wanted to say, if you had the chance to meet these animals, and not just be told that you should save them and not just be told that their lives are more important than yours, then maybe you might actually connect to them and wanna save them for yourself or wanna be that person who saves them when you grow up or wanna tell your grandparents to stop hunting them because they don't need to anymore. Um, and so what they were and what they are, is just amazing. Every year they grow into something new and something more amazing and surprising where people come from all over Uganda and ask questions and we'll spend all day there and we'll bring their brothers and their sisters and their mothers and they're so proud and they're and they're enjoying it and they're using it for exactly the purpose that it was made for. Yeah, um, back in 2006, we opened the first one and it was the first museum of its kind ever in the country, just a natural history museum in the village for the Ugandans to enjoy. And, and at this point we have five of them all scattered around Kibali National Park. Uh, over 40,000 people visited last year. So they're getting a lot of people coming in and just learning about science and nature in a fun way. That's incredible. And I love that. Who works there? Are you employing people to work there too? Yeah, all it's all, um, all Ugandan staff. And I didn't tell them the story, but when Michael and I left Uganda the first time, we came back and brought kids into the forest. We said, let's just get them in. And some of the kids that we brought in in 2002 are now people who work for us and are our staff at our science centers, um, or people who went to one of our first competitions that we'll talk about and said, I want to be with these people. Like, there's something going on here that I, that I need to be connected to. Um, and, uh, it's, and some of our people have left and moved on to really amazing things. So it's this process of, of um, again, just kind of creating opportunities and being lifelong, you know, being lifelong partners and existing together and saying, we're here for the long haul. We're here to watch you grow and move on. We're here to watch you grow and bring your younger sister in um, and help us make this something that's always going to have an impact. And that's always going to bring, you know, something to help solve the issues that are affecting chimps and the forests and all the things that we started to do all this for. And they're all there and they're all really, their heart is really in it. I love it. I had the honor of meeting a little girl that when I see her there, I'm so happy to see her every time, but I'll never forget. She was telling me so many things about nature and chimpanzees in such an eloquent way. And she's like, if you were to go to any of the science centers, you would see that I took out every book at every science center and I've done every study. And that is how I know <laughs> she was really freaking smart. Yeah. Um, 
and that, you know, that there's a place to honor that kind of curiosity or spark that kind of curiosity is amazing. And what a great place thing to donate to, you know, to donate for microscopes, to donate for um, skull replicants or whatever it is you use. Um, such a worthy thing to, to give to. Yeah. Yeah. We're always trying to keep the exhibits new and changing. So with so many amazing animals in Uganda, we can always have nice displays about the animals, but then the libraries are always growing and changing. We have all kinds of science uh, books, nature books, but also school curriculum books so that the kids who can't afford books at school can come in and do their studying there. And uh, yeah, the, the, like you said though, to always keep adding to it, changing it, moving it between the science centers. So certainly, that is something we would be spending some of these donations on. It's fun, cool stuff for the science centers. Yeah. Okay. Well, it looks like there's something I want to um, look closely at. What are in the blue bins outside this science center? Because oh. you're dealing with some serious deforestation issues. It takes more yes. than education. Thank you for asking. If you look very, very closely, those blue bins are full yes, of eco-char, which is a eco-friendly biomass briquette. And here's some photos of, of ladies making it. I mean, the science centers are a really great way to get people interested and to pull them in the door with fun stuff. And then we start talking about really serious things. So you have to cook your dinner. That's one of the issues that we talked about. 95% um, of Ugandans have wood or charcoal as their only source of energy. Okay, so we're not talking only about those in poverty living around the park. Even if you live in the capital city in an apartment in a high rise, 95% of people are using charcoal to cook their dinner with. So we need to fix that. And the, the biomass briquettes, the eco char, is one of the ways that we're doing that. So this is made out of farm waste. And in this photo, you see um, this is just carbonized waste. Any, any organic material can be carbonized. And so we didn't invent this. This is basically the same process that charcoal briquettes in America go through, and it's been used all over the world. All that we did was make it doable on a village level so that the folks around Kibali can have the same uh, thing that we have in that regard. So this is carbonized farm waste that is then compacted into a briquette, and you can cook your dinner in an eco-friendly way. And we actually have two different types of briquettes. We have the one in this picture, burns exactly like real charcoal. It actually lasts a little bit longer and burns a little bit hotter, so it is preferable. But charcoal costs money, and so that means that we can actually sell this, and we sell it in Uganda at the science centers to help fund the rest of the project. We have another product um, made from non-carbonized waste, and that's what you can actually see in this photo here. Um, and this is bartered with people who cannot afford to pay for their cooking fuel. These are the folks that would be going out into the forest and actively cutting down trees just to cook with. And so the non-carbonized briquettes are made from a much broader range of farm waste. So we're talking banana peels, potato peels, peanut shells, avocado pits, really anything that you've got on your farm. And remember, waste has a different definition in Uganda. You're not feeding it to the pigs. You're not composting it to use on your farm. It's really a whole separate class of unwanted stuff that can then be pulverized, mixed together in the right ratios, compressed, and it burns just like firewood. So that people will come in with their farm waste and trade and go home with uh, a sack full of, of briquettes to cook with. That's amazing. And I just love how you involve people. Um, like you're all in this together. And then, so you do the education, you prevent um, too much fuel wood collection, and then what is happening here? So this is one of the earlier parts of the project, actually. This is, the first step was plant trees, okay? If we're cutting down too many trees and we need firewood to cook with, let's plant some trees. So we focus on fast growing trees that are already found in Uganda that can grow without harming the environment at all. Um, and those are some little baby sesbania trees there being grown in recycled liquor sachets. So, so that was step one. Step two is making a fuel efficient stove. And we found this online. Again, we did not invent this. This is called a rocket stove. And basically a rocket stove is just a fire with the very controlled way of getting air to that fire that makes it burn much, much more efficiently. So by using one of these rocket stoves, you can save a 30 to 60% of the firewood that you would otherwise have been using. And so the woman in the photo here 
is sitting in front of two different rocket stoves. The larger one in the back is a double burnered rocket stove that, um, that she's using firewood in, and then the smaller one that she has her hand on is a rocket stove designed to burn the briquettes better. Um, yeah. All right. um, I wanted to pop in this question because it was particularly about this from Patrick. Um, does the briquette not put off any undesirable gases? Like, is there anything like that that happens? It's, it's a great question. question. Yeah. Um, so one of the wonderful things about the rocket stove is because it has that, if you look in the front of the picture there, that small little rectangle is the only place the fire can get its air from. Mm -hmm. And so with the hot air rising and that, that small opening, the only place for it to get its air, it sucks it in there. And that's just as if you were hitting the fire with a bellows continuously. And that makes it burn just a tad hotter than a typical firewood, and that burns up most of the any any fumes or gases that might be considered bad. It even burns up a lot more of the particulate matter, so there's a lot less particulate matter from these stoves. So they have actually been shown to be healthier for the cooks, who in Uganda are usually the women, and the children, who are usually hanging out in the kitchen with mom as she cooks. So there have been numerous studies showing that rocket stoves are actually healthier way to cook in addition to being uh, good for the environment. Yep. Oop. Hopefully that answered the question. Yeah, you answered it. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so time is flying and I want to say that Oakland Zoo has gotten to visit this project a couple times and one of the highlights is this party that you throw. What is it that why did you decide that having big events like your movie night or these competitions was a way forward? And I'm excited to share some of these photos. Okay, so these are our competitions that happen in December and hopefully will happen this year. And, um, you know, a lot of what we do is one on one people coming into people's homes and sitting with them and chatting and taking forever and making mud. And it's this really slow, <laughs> slow process. And that's why our numbers aren't as big as maybe some other organizations, because we really spend a lot of time with people to talk to them about this process. But we said, how can we reach a larger audiences? Every time anybody I know has visited Uganda, some group, school group, women's group, whatever, is like, we should dance for them. And it's like, okay. I mean, I certainly don't dance when my friends come over to my house, but um, so it, that's how it started. It was an, it was an idea of, how do we get Ugandans to bring in more of this tremendous culture that is that is just you know impacted everybody's lives and connected to conservation better? So it was how do we say if chimpanzees are the subject, but you want to dance your local Batoro dance, how do we connect that? How do we bring stoves into that by having a competition for who can build a stove the fastest? How do we teach people that these stoves work? Well, if you feed people, it always brings in huge problems. So we started doing a bean competition, like the Iron Chef of Ugandan beans. And so 10 to 20 cooks in each area are coming with their beans using a certain amount of firewood, a fuel efficient stove. The judges sit, there's testing, there's rules. There's very, very judging, serious. Very serious. And then in the end, um, somebody wins amazing prizes. There's what, 20 kilos? And we've got 20 kilos of beans, beans to feed the crowd with at the end also. So. Brilliant. The chef gets to stand in front of everybody and say, look at how little what it took to, to, to cook these beans. Everybody, look at how great this stove is. Look at what you can do if you're a part of this project. And then we all jump up for joy, and then we dance about it and sing about it. And um, we did a fashion show this year. There's a video on our website. We can't even get into all the things that we do. And we couldn't do it if the community didn't want to do it. That's kind of the key because I've worked in other areas where people are not as receptive to this type of gathering. Um, but uh, a any type of, of obstacle we throw out, as long as and that's connected to conservation, people just jump at the opportunity to be a part of it and to celebrate it and learn about it and teach each other about it. Yeah, the beauty of it really is that it's the Ugandans teaching the other Ugandans about conservation in a traditional way, doing all the traditional songs, traditional dances, and it's just the words have been changed to be singing about Kibali and conservation. And just like I don't want to sit here and tell you the same thing every year, I don't want to sit here and tell the people that I work with that 
thousands of people in Uganda, it's the same thing. So we're always trying to grow new ideas, new innovations, trying to tackle the newer problems that are facing the communities. What's really the struggle this year and how can we address it in a fun but really relative, I mean, um, uh, relevant, thank you, relevant way. Um, so that's why, you know, this new thing with fashion, it's, it's getting engaging this audience of people that is using Facebook, that's finally using social media and how they can get their message out to such a broader audience. So every year we're trying to grow it and see how can we connect chimps, Kibali, Ugandans in a way that's going to change a whole new group of people and connect a whole new group of people. Um, I will just say that this day on earth I'll speak for myself, but I'll speak for all the people who've gone on the trips that I've gotten to take has been, they look at me in the face and say, this is one of the best days of my life. It's the joy and embracing each other, embracing this project. I mean, what's going on with this woman and her chimp? Like they're so, they're all about nature, but they're just having the most fun, more fun than, than I have observed in my lifetime. Yeah, and you mentioned the video shows too, right? So we'll be showing, say, yeah. some kind of wildlife film that shows chimps breastfeeding their babies or doing all these other things the same as people do. And then at the competitions, this year the theme was, or the year this photo was taken, it was chimpanzees past, present, and future. Yeah. And so that was the theme, and each of the competing groups had to interpret it in the way that that they chose. And so some of them really were showing how chimpanzees were so, so similar to humans based on what they'd seen at the video show. Some of them were doing things that they might see if a chimp does come and raid their farm, because that is a very real issue that people are dealing with. There. One woman bare-breasted fed a fake baby chimp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't expect a paper mache chimpanzee head. Uh, so you never know that just like I'm seeing the comments and I'm seeing like bug tasting and donuts like you never know what a day is going to going to bring as long as you come with the right attitude and you come with the respect of first connecting with people and respecting people and where they're coming from, then you can make a, a, a really big difference. Hopefully every day is what we're trying to do. Yeah, I want to highlight this kid because um, and hear what's going on here, because like I said in the beginning. You And like you're saying to us now, it's never the same old thing. Um, humans don't like that. You're always thinking of new ideas. And I, you were sitting next to me going, I don't know what's going to happen with this idea. And then we saw magic. So what is happening in this photo? It's a recycled fashion show. I mean, uh, there's some really great fashion shows on TV in America. We all love them. They have the unconventional materials challenge. Why not bring it to Uganda? We were starting to talk more about trash and because, you know, when we first started going to Uganda, you would get your soda in a glass bottle and bring it back to the store, just like we did here in the States years and years ago. Now they get it in a plastic bottle, just like we do. And there's a lot more trash around. And so we wanted to bring in a, a fun way to get people thinking about that trash differently. You guys have to watch the video. We we were blown away, just like Amy was saying. I think he's wearing like a flower bag and maybe some milk bags. And we we had no idea that people would would create. I, I hoped, but um. And the pride that they were taking in these objects of art that they had made out of trash, and you know, never would have looked at these things in that light before. But here they are, strutting in front of their community, dancing having a great time while at the same time giving that message of reusing trash or reducing your waste. Um, it's something we really enjoyed too, yeah. It, it's just incredible. All right, so before we move too much further, I have another question. You know this lady. Hi. Linda. Yeah. How long does it take for the new trees to grow to where they can be harvested? So we focus on a few species that grow extremely fast. Um, our number one performers are uh, Cespania and Caliandra, and they can be harvested after less than a year, usually. And the great part about the Cespania is that it grows extremely fast. Usually after six months to a year, you can harvest it for firewood. Now, the interesting thing about firewood, and you know this if you, if you heat your house with firewood, is that the smaller pieces actually burn more efficiently and hotter than the bigger pieces do. So 
the tree doesn't need to get to be the size of a rainforest tree to make good firewood. Oftentimes it's only a couple inches in diameter, but it's a nice dense wood. It makes a very, very good firewood. And then the caliandra actually sprouts right back again after you cut it. So the sesbania grows super fast. You can plant it around your farm and in six months to a year have a whole bunch of firewood. The caliandra, you do the same thing. It doesn't grow as fast, but when you cut it down, it just sprouts back so you never have to replant. And the great thing about both of those species is that they are legumes. So again, the people that we're working with, one acre is the average farm size. They don't have space for a woodlot. A lot of people ask us, what about community woodlots? That space doesn't really exist. There are woodlots and they're owned by rich people who own a lot of land and then they sell that wood to become timber. Um, but for the everyday folk who are trying to cook their dinner, they don't, don't have the space for that. They need a plant they can plant right next to their crops without taking away any nutrients from their crops. And so the great thing about leguminous trees is they add nitrogen to the soil. They actually fertilize the plants that are growing around them. So they grow super fast, very dense wood, and uh, six months to a year, you've got your firewood crop. So Amazing. those trees that you guys help plant have probably been harvested a couple times oh, yeah, over by now. for sure. Wow. All right, Linda, you've planted a forest by now. Um, okay, so I have some more images I want to show, but um, I just have to say, like, it is amazing to me with everything going on in the world, um, and I'm sure, you know, Uganda's affected too, that you guys are just always positive and hopeful and have the next great idea. So I guess I'll just pose to you, like, can you shed some of that hope and positivity on us? Um, it would be good timing. And... And what keeps you just feeling really optimistic, especially when you're stuck here and you can't even go there? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're not always, but thank you. Um, I think that um, being a part of this project is what keeps us optimistic. And so all of you should become a part of it because when you connect with even one person um, on Facebook or through me or through a letter or in some way, you you automatically kind of feel like something that you did make a di made a difference, and I think that we all kind of need to feel like we're not just these invisible people struggling every day with all of these awful things. That um, there's a reason that we all exist here, and there and there's a reason that even though we all struggle, we all continue to excel because. There's so much out there to enjoy and be a part of, and we can't give up, and we can't we can't let those places that maybe aren't at the forefront of our minds right now disappear just because there are other issues that are going on. I mean, the, one of the important things to remember is that all of these issues are linked, right? So the fires in California, the hurricanes that are hitting the Gulf right now, uh, the virus that's going all around the world. All of these things are linked to conservation. And once you can at least be trying to make a difference and making a difference for at least some small corner of wildlife in the world, that, that really does help to keep us positive. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, so I love this image I wanna share and I wanna hear about it, that even from home you created, you move forward. So what is the story with this? So our newest plan of attack was waste, right? We started with the Recycled Fashion Show. We're starting to see just, just awful heaps and heaps of trash and rubbish all over Uganda. And so I partnered with some local artists, Eco Action and um, Atoki Gallery. And these are sculptors and artists. And we took all the scrap that we could find and we created a three and a half meter tall elephant that is on the main road into Fort Portal. So anybody coming coming or going has to see it, has to start seeing that there's something else we can be doing with all of the, the waste and to connect it to nature. To, it's, it's kind of that first idea is what we're hoping is this, is this is creating. We also are now doing murals that are um, uh, with different types of materials so that we're also using waste in those. The first step is giving people an idea that, that all this trash can be beautiful and that it be, can be connected to nature. The second step is to say the negative effects that acts on nature. And the third step will be, here's all the amazing things each one of you can do. 
Um, and because it was just a few artists, they didn't have to be large gatherings. We didn't have to have, you know, big events in order to get this done, but yet everybody is still going to be able to see this because you can't ignore this as you're passing by. So that's kind of the next step in where we're going while still maintaining. For, for those who don't know the metric system, that's, that's, that's a life-size elephant, life-size bull elephant. It's big. Yeah, it's, sorry, I, I don't have the perfect system to show it, but you can see the little guy there oh, yeah. compared to that huge. Yeah. It's incredible and so creative and so impressive and the show must go yeah. on. This is gonna, we're hoping that this is actually gonna put us on such a larger stage because so many people are, everyone's gonna see it. And so people are gonna start wondering who put up that elephant and how can we put that elephant up other places? And um, we've got trash all over the place. So how do we, so we're hoping that this ends up, you know, funding more projects all, all around national parks and um, we can put up signs, we can create recycling bins, we can then turn all that trash into art, into chairs, into rubbish bins, into flower pots, into, into buildings. buildings. Yeah. Um, so, and I also needed to inspire our staff as they are not able to work as much as they were. They needed something to remind them that there's a reason to keep going, that there's someone out there that's still thinking about them and uh, wanting to keep push forward on protecting Kibali and the chimps and everything that we have that we work for. Amazing. Well, we only have a few okay. more minutes and I want to share this one last photo because um, I don't know, like you said, it gives you just to see <laughs> How vibrant you are within this project and how much joy I can just feel and recognize the joy on people's faces and the knowledge they must have that somebody cares and that they're part of an ecosystem and they're part of a community um, that's, that's doing something so special. So I guess from all of us, we just really want to say thank you for what you do. Um, you inspire me. You're inspiring people watching. Hopefully, you'll inspire other people when I keep on sharing this video. But please tell us now, how can we help you? Yeah. Um, we really want this to count. I know. We were talking so sweet and so inspiring. But there's a menu coming up. But the first thing I do want to say is... Um, We've only received one grant all year. We've only received $18,000 in total for funding for 2020, and the project will cost over 100000 So um, as guilty as I felt a couple months ago about saying we still need money, I don't feel guilty anymore because we're really doing some great stuff, and we really, we are, we are really, really do need support because we have zoos and animal organizations that were supporting us, and they are struggling so much that they can't find the money this year, and we need to find other places to get it. Yeah, and and really, a little bit goes a long way in Uganda. If you look at the list here, so we have five science centers. It's a it's a museum that's open. Like I said, tens of thousands of people coming every year. It only costs five thousand dollars to run each of those each year. And so if you've got $5,000 and you'd like to adopt one of those science centers, please uh, get in touch with us. We would love to work with you. But also for $25, we can take a group of seven people into the Botanic Gardens in Fort Portal. So the Botanic Gardens are there and they're not very expensive for Ugandans to enter, but even that little bit of money is an impediment to most folks. So we have our science center staff lead tours through the, through the, through the botanic garden. So for, for 25 bucks, you can send a, a nice sized group of people to the, to the botanic gardens to just uh, get to be one with nature. We've been hiking in the redwoods with you right around uh, the Bay Area. And anybody who's done that knows that you just, get a sense of why these things are important when you do that. And the more and more Ugandans that take part in that, um, the, the greater feeling they have for protecting their own environment. So a little bit more money, and instead of going to the Botanic Gardens, we go to Kibale National Park and see chimps. And this thing that had only been for tourists up until uh, when all of a sudden these folks can go in and see it for themselves. So any amount of money would help us. Like Rebecca said, we really, really need your help right now. So please, uh, and thank you. Well, I'm glad you're not being shy. I mean, this is why we're watching. You know, normally we raise money at Oakland Zoo through entries and through these events that we haven't been able to raise money. This is our way of, of really just opening up the magnificent work you're doing to people who care. Um, I can see lots of people commenting that they're happy to donate and they care. Um, even having companies match their donation and 
thank you. And to think, you know, if I think of the items you need inside the science centers and the tree planting and paying the salaries of these young people who work at the science centers or who um, make the eco briquettes. Yeah, making the briquettes is not easy work. That is no. dirty work. And so uh, paying the salaries of those folks who are sweating and bleeding for this rainforest, that, that's needed. It's needed. And what better way to donate if I five thousand dollars to support all of that or twenty five to do such a special thing um, seems like a great way to a great way to spend money if you have it. Um, all right. So any last questions before we roll? I'm seeing lots of thank yous um, and lots of inspiring um, people who are just happy to hear all about this. Um, I want to do one last toast to you and all you do and keep on, keep on doing what you're doing. Um, it goes such a long way to help these people, but such a long way to make us feel like we can be part of something so incredible and so important. Thank you. Thank you. And Cheers. it's been a pleasure talking with you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you for always being a supporter of our work. And, um, we really, we all do need every day, we need something to bring a little light. And I swear this project can bring light to each and every one of you. So just write me or write Amy and um, whatever, however we can get people involved, we, we want to. All right, um, yes, I've noticed your, your website has donation opportunities, but also volunteers and being in touch and spreading the word. And I bet if anyone feels passionate, you'll give them a job to do. All right. All right. Have a great night, everybody. We'll see you next time. And by the way, Thank the next time you, ninth, um, we will be um, meeting with Project Tamarin Proyecto TT. And um, that'll be wonderful, too. All right. Be well. And cheers. Bye-bye. <laughs>